I was born in 1989. It was the year Nirvana's debut album, Bleach, came out. The Little Mermaid became part of our world. And a baby named Taylor Allison Swift took her first breath of air in Reading, Pennsylvania. It was also the year the World Wide Web was invented. I've grown up with the internet, starting with Reader Rabbit in elementary school, losing mules on the Oregon Trail, and creating Lisa Frankified acid trip-like art using Microsoft Paint. <laughs> My first AOL screen name was Persian Tay, not because I'm Persian, but because I was really, really into Persian cats during middle school. In high school, <laughs> I was way too scared to have a MySpace page because I was certain I would be kidnapped by a 40-something-year-old dude who lived in his mom's basement. So instead, with the help of my friend and crush Kevin, when I was 17, we made my very first Facebook account. Kevin had an older brother who went to Arizona State, and he had convinced me that this is what all of the cool college kids were doing. Once I got to college myself, I discovered Twitter, and that changed everything. This eventually led to editors at the Huffington Post tweeting at me asking if I would blog for their website upon reading my critique of their divorce vertical, which I had originally written for my campus newspaper. Fast forward to graduation, three months later, I got my first job as a blog editor for one of the biggest news sites on the web, owned by AOL no less. This is a job that wouldn't have existed 10 years earlier. Today, living in New York City in my 20s, I find myself turning to the internet to find love, or something like it, by downloading, deleting, and re-downloading dating apps. I won't touch my brunch until I've Instagrammed it. I haven't owned or watched a TV in years. Everything that I need to see can be seen from my MacBook Air. I document my nights out via Snapchats. I order Seamless when I'm feeling too lazy to cook. And when I'm tired and I can't fall asleep at night, I'll lie under the covers watching my favorite vines over and over again, the light of my iPhone screen illuminating my face in the dark. Hi, my name is Taylor and I'm a social media addict. My life, both professionally and personally, orbits around the internet. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Despite the tired millennial stereotypes, I've made real friendships online, I've landed dream jobs, and I've made meaningful connections with people that are just as valid as meeting someone down the street over overpriced artisanal coffee in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. For me, social media helps me to make my mark, but not just in a literal, my tweets will live on the internet forever, digital footprint kind of way. It's more than that. Social media has given me a voice, it's provided me a platform, and it's given me a community. And I've seen it do the same for thousands of other people. What's interesting, though, is as a culture, we're obsessed with the narrative of online life versus life. That once we power off our smartphones and disconnect ourselves from our Wi-Fi connections, that's when we're really engaging with the world and really L-I-V-I-N, man. The reality is, online life and life are no longer two separate entities. In fact, they're now synonymous. It's just life. But like with any relationship that I have in life, the one I have with social media is complicated. And I'm not just talking about that one time when I texted my date, a text that was intended for my best friend, about how lame our evening had been. I'm talking about that when I'm on an airplane and I don't have Wi-Fi, it feels like my oxygen levels are slowly being depleted and the high altitude isn't to blame. I'm talking about that I'll lie awake in bed at night, swiping when I should be sleeping. A friend of mine once told me that she can't fall asleep until she gets a match on Tinder. Yeah. <laughs> Another friend of mine, she said that she'll intentionally wait until after 8 p.m. to put a photo on Instagram because she knows that's when she'll get optimal amount of likes. It may sound crazy, but I can totally relate. I get it. We all want validation, whether it's from our friends, our family, our bosses, even strangers on the internet. What's fascinating, though, to me is that even when we do get this approval that we so desperately crave, oftentimes it feels like it's not quite deserved. So I've done a lot of thinking about this as a 20-something who's growing up with the internet, and recently I kind of come to an epiphany of sorts. We're all just faking it. 
you, me, Kim Kardashian, that girl you went to high school with whose life mirrors a Pinterest board, the CEO of that Fortune 500 company, all of us. And here's what else I've realized. Faking it isn't necessarily a bad thing. I wouldn't be standing here in front of all of you bright, talented, full of potential college students if I hadn't faked it till I made it. That doesn't mean that I conned my way to get here or somehow cheated the system, but I faked it. There have been so many times in my life where I've thought to myself, I don't deserve to be here. Or they, whoever they is, is going to wake up one day and say, sorry babe, gig's up, your cover's been blown, you're not as good as you present yourself to be. This is called imposter syndrome, and it's a very real, very dangerous thing to fall victim to because you're basically allowing yourself to get in the way of your own success. The thing is, every successful person has had moments of insecurity. Beyonce, Steve Jobs, even Hillary Clinton, and she just might be our first female president. The difference is, is that when these people didn't feel like winners or they didn't feel at the top of their game, they didn't let people see them sweat. They owned their awesomeness. They put on that Harry Potter cloak of invisibility and said, I got this. That's the good kind of faking it. Now here comes the not so good kind of faking it, and it's the kind we're all really familiar with. It's the one where we spend 20 minutes picking the perfect filter for our selfie, the one that eliminates any signs of childhood acne or skin blemishes. It's the kind that when we post a photo on Instagram, feel self-conscious and then take it down when it doesn't get enough likes. Whether intentional or not, we're all carefully curating the image of ourselves on social media that we want to present to the world. And because this is so ingrained in us and we do it so often every single day, you might start to feel like you're a bit of an imposter or you're not being your authentic self. In 2016, we hear a lot about the term authenticity. But what does that even mean? It's become this increasingly used buzzword, and I think it's a direct correlation to the fact that we live in a world that's increasingly saturated with social media. It's 24-7, and it's not going away. This is a photo of me that was posted on my Instagram account from this past New Year's Eve. Uh, you probably can't tell, but I was feeling really, really insecure that night. So a couple of days before, I was home in Connecticut visiting family for the holidays. And before I headed back to New York City, which is where I live, I went to the local mall to get my eyebrows threaded, as I usually do. So I'm sitting at this eyebrow salon, and this woman is threading my eyebrows. And all of a sudden, like she's talking. I don't know what's going on. She starts to thread my face. Now, I've never had my face threaded before. I've never had a reason to. I might have like a little bit of peach fuzz on my cheeks or my jawline. but. Nothing crazy, and she made me almost start to think, do I have like massive amounts of facial hair that suddenly just needs to like be stripped off my face? But it was really weird. I could feel like my skin like not having a good reaction to it. So I said, thank you, paid, left, ran out of the mall. Went back to New York. And that's when <laughs> this picture was taken, and it was also earlier that day when my face had broken out into a horrible rash, like one of those red, bumpy, oh my God, type of rashes on my face. And I tried putting makeup on it, I washed it off, put more makeup on it, it didn't work, it just made it even more irritated. And it was so unfortunate because here I was with my best friend who I live with, my brother from LA was in town, I was in the most magical city on the world, in the world on one of the most magical nights and I felt like a leper. But I posted this photo on Instagram that night. Does that make me an imposter? I'd argue no. I'd say I'm just using social media like everybody else. So the thing is, is that whether or not we have social media, these feelings of insecurity are going to be there. FOMO, fear of missing out, is going to exist. We're always going to compare our lives to one another's, and we're always going to just want people to like us. These things are always going to manifest. Social media just happens to amplify them. So the way I see it, we can either fight or we can embrace social media. But even if you have wholeheartedly embraced social media the way I have, it's okay to admit if sometimes it makes you a little annoyed, insecure, or even a little left out. And while I don't have the solution or all the answers to prevent those feelings from happening, I do have a couple of tips that maybe can help to not let you drive yourself to insanity as a result of social media. The first is take a break. 
So if you're a social media addict like I am, that might seem pretty impossible, but sometimes you just need to take clean Ross Geller, Rachel Green card and just take a good old fashioned break. This is a photo I took less than a week ago. I was on vacation in Valencia, Spain with my best friend. And while we were there, we had basically little to no internet access because we would basically be spending a month's rent on cellular data, which we weren't about to do. So the only time I was able to check my email, post on Instagram, see what was going on in Snapchat, was essentially in my Airbnb or at random cafes where we could steal their Wi-Fi. And at first, it felt like I was walking around missing limbs, and it was like really strange just not being able to just check my phone. But after a couple of days, it kind of felt nice, and I kind of didn't miss hearing the world complain about everything on Twitter. And something tells me they probably didn't miss me. Two, think about the person behind the account. So behind every weird anonymous avatar, egg avatar on Twitter, there's a real live breathing human being. And that's important to remember because just, you know, it's it's just good to remember that there's a real person who's going to be affected by what you say, but more so because you can make real friendships online with other people the same way I have. Also, it's a good reminder that human beings are very, very flawed individuals, which brings me to my next point. Stop comparing yourself to strangers on the internet. So, <laughs> Nine times out of 10, I'm only gonna show you the good stuff. I'm not gonna show you a picture of me with greasy hair hung over in my bed on a Sunday morning. I'm not gonna show you Monday night's dinner which consisted of gluten-free frozen chicken nuggets. I am though going to show you this beautiful picture of nachos which I Instagrammed in Valencia, uh, a plate of nachos that my friend and I inhaled. And if you're wondering if I used the Valencia filter, you bet I did. Four, Keep yourself in check. So one of my, as an editor, one of kind of my rules of thumb are is if I wouldn't say something out loud, if I wouldn't say it out in the universe, if I wouldn't say it to my friend, I'm not going to post it on social media. It just doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel real. And that's something that I tell people every day. If you wouldn't say it, don't post it. And five, and this might be the most important, do it for you and no one else. So my friends and I will joke all the time, do it for the gram, do it for the gram. Or if you didn't post it on Instagram, it didn't happen. That's bullshit. So <laughs> basically, social media, it's for you. It's how you want to use it. And you should post that photo of you looking badass and hot in a crop top if you feel good about it, not because you're seeking validation from others. So what am I saying? At the end of the day, I'm not here to tell you to stop Instagramming your brunch. I am not here to tell you to quit using filters. I'm not here to tell you how or how not to use social media. What I am saying, though, is that maybe if we can all collectively agree that, yeah, we're all just faking it, maybe just a little, in doing so, we can give ourselves permission to accept being flawed, to embrace imperfection to be more real in a society where it's become increasingly difficult to tell what's real and what isn't. And that is a whole lot more powerful than any number of likes. Thank you.